Good morning. Welcome to Monday Manna. This is Gwen Molietta proclaiming his word ministry. I've been doing some teachings the last several weeks, maybe even a couple of months on the manifestations or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, today I'm going to be teaching on the gift of prophecy. But I want to let you know that there's teachings already on YouTube, especially the one I want you to avail yourself to maybe after this teaching is how to judge a prophecy. Uh, I've already taught it, so I'm not going to do it again. But as I teach today on the gift of prophecy, you have to understand that prophecy is to be judged. And so you can just go onto my YouTube page and type in my name and then put how to judge a prophecy and that teaching will come up for you. So I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to read verses 1 through 5. And I'll pray first. Father, I just want to thank you for the word of God. I thank you that we've been given precious promises and that, Lord, every word has been inspired of the Holy Spirit to be written. It's profitable. It helps us. It challenges us. It causes us to grow. And, Lord, very few things in the Bible are we ever told to covet. But prophecy is one of them. So I ask this morning uh, that people, when they hear this teaching, would begin to desire and want to be able to prophesy, to speak for you and from you. Bless our time together now, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You might want to grab a pen or paper because I'm going to give you some really important things that even though we think we can't ever forget, trust me, write it down and then I hope you remember where you put the paper. But uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5, it says, follow after charity, which is the verb word love, and desire spiritual. And then the commentators added the word gifts. Whenever you see a word in italics in the scripture, it's been added to help us understand the meaning. So really it says, follow after love and desire spiritual, but rather that you may prophesy. Verse two, for he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but unto God. No one understands him. Howbeit in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. He that prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Verse 4. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. Verse 5. I would that you all spoke in tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he may interpret that the church would receive edifying. Oh, I can't wait till I get to the teaching on tongues and interpretation. But let's say focus on prophecy. Let me give you a definition of prophecy from this particular chapter. It means to speak forth under divine inspiration. To speak forth under a divine inspiration. And so basically, prophecy is just to speak for God or from God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we're actually told to covet this and to desire this. But let's take a look at the purpose of the gift of prophecy. All right. To speak forth under the divine inspiration of God. First Corinthians uh, 14, three gives us three purposes for the gift of prophecy. And I want to just take a moment, to define them for you as a Bible teacher. The first is edification. The second is exhortation. And the third is comfort. So when we speak forth from God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we begin to prophesy and speak for God, it should do three things. It should edify, exhort, and comfort. And so the definition of the word edification means to improve your understanding. Prophecy should draw you to God, not from God. And so the gift of prophecy exhorts. And again, uh, it edifies first to improve your understanding. Then it exhorts you, exhortation. It means to call someone close to you. And the third is to comfort you, to give you strength and hope. So here's the definition. I don't think I did that justice. Let me do it again. First Corinthians 14, three, he that speaks prophetically speaks to men for edification, to improve your understanding. Exhortation, to call you near and closer to God and comfort to strengthen you and give you hope. I wrote in my Bible next to these three that edification will build you up, exhortation will stir you up, comfort will cheer you up. 
It'll build you up, stir you up, and cheer you up. Now let's look at a couple basic things about prophecy, the gift of prophecy, because never in my lifetime, and I've been serving the Lord over 40 years, have I seen so many people on the internet prophesying. Some are prophet lying, some are prophesying, um, but we really need to understand this gifting from God. So I want to turn to Luke 1, and I want to show you a couple things. Number one, prophecy, Luke chapter 1, should always line up with scripture. It should, matter of fact, that if it's filled with scripture, you're far better off. When you prophesy, it should be filled with scripture and, and the word of God. And so I thought of, and I'm not going to read all this because it's very lengthy, but I thought of Zechariah when he got filled with the Holy Spirit and he began to prophesy. So if you have your Bible, I'm in Luke 1. I just want to read a few verses, starting at verse 67. Point number one, I want to make, let me see, uh, one, two, three, five, five points uh, about prophecy today. Number one, it should be filled with scripture. It must always line up with scripture, obviously. Verse 67 of Luke 1. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He visited and redeemed his people. He raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Verse 71, I guess I am going to read some of it. It's a great prophecy. That we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy, holy covenant. It goes all the way through to verse 79. And here's what I want you to notice. In my Bible, I have a small column in the middle. And it'll give me Old and New Testament references for the verse I'm reading. And so he begins to prophesy in verse 68. And he ends up pro ending his prophecy in verse 79. I really should not have stopped. It's so awesome. Uh, if you look at verse 77, to give knowledge to salvation to the people by the remission of our sin. That the tender mercy of our God, when the day spring should visit from on high, that's Jesus, to give us light for those that sat in darkness, the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Here's what I want you to notice. In these verses, I counted the Old Testament scriptures that he used or made reference to. And I want you to know that there are 31 references to Bible verses in the Old Testament that line up with this prophecy in the New Testament. And so it isn't even um, 68 to 79. What is it? 11 verses. In 11 verses, there are 31 references to Old Testament scripture. I didn't even include the New Testament verses. So when you begin to prophesy or you hear someone prophesying, it should line up with scripture. Now, I don't have the time to get into this. It's a little too deep. But there's a difference between the uh, a prophet and a person who prophesies. All of us can prophesy, but not all of us are prophets. And you know, I've done teachings uh, on the ministry gifts in Ephesians, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. The prophet can give you a word of correction. The prophet can foretell future things. So when it comes to the office of a prophet, that can be a little harder sometimes a little harsh, but the gift of prophecy, I don't want to call it simple, but the simple gift of prophecy is for all of us. We're to covet it, we're to ask for it, we're to pray for it. And what it does is, is it edifies, exhorts, and comforts, but it can be, should be, and must be, I think, filled with and in agreement with scriptures at all times. And you know, I'm not going to get political, but we've had a whole lot of prophecies recently that in the doesn't look like they came to pass. And I'm just leaving that with you um, because you have to learn how to judge a prophecy. So number one, it must be filled with and in line with scripture. Um, number two, I wanted to turn to Acts 19 and show you how it can be, uh, a, I don't want to use the word side effect, 
but it can be a manifestation. That's a much better word. It can be a manifestation of when someone gets spirit filled. We always think when someone gets spirit filled, Acts 2, 4, they were all filled with the spirit and began to speak in tongues. We always think that that's the only evidence of being spirit filled, but it is not. One of the evidences of being spirit filled is you'll begin to prophesy. And so I want to read Acts 19 verses 1 to 6. So number one, it should be filled with scripture. Number two, it can be an evidence of a person who is filled with the spirit. Acts 19, I want to read 1 to 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and he found certain disciples, certain disciples. These are believers. And he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we have not even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. You understand they hadn't heard about the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, he said, unto what were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. So they had heard of the baptism of repentance for sins coming to God. Verse 4, then said Paul, John baptized you with the baptism of repentance, saying that people should believe on him that would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, the disciples, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now look what happens in verse 6. When Paul lays his hands on them, the Holy Ghost comes on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. So not only is uh, one of the evidences of being spirit-filled, uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you speak in other tongues to God. But here they began to prophesy. And so I wanted you to see that when you're spirit filled, it is also a way for you to move in the gift of prophecy. Paul laid his hands on these men, 12 of them. They all began to speak in tongues and they began to prophesy. Now I'm going to give you a side note. I'll get to this when I teach on tongues and interpretation there was no interpretation to these speaking in tongues in this in these two verses. In verse 6, when Paul laid his hands on these men, they all began to speak in tongues and prophesy. And the Bible said there were 12 men. The reason the tongues weren't interpreted it, is it was not a gift from God to the congregation. It was their spirit praising and praying to God so it didn't have to be interpreted. I'll be doing teachings on that in the future. But I wanted you to see that they began to prophesy. And so that's another thing about um, the gift of prophecy. It not only should be filled with scripture, but it is evidence or manifestation that you have the Holy Spirit in you, that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm only going to take a minute, but I want to tell you about a church I spoke at a number of years ago, a large Methodist church. And they asked me to come every Tuesday and teach their women's Bible study. And they had a wonderful attendance, probably 70, 80 women came every Tuesday. And I would drive, it was a, a good distance for me, about an hour and a half. I would drive up, teach their Bible study, drive back. So I did this for like six weeks. Well, I didn't know that there was not necessarily a hidden camera, but I didn't even know there was a camera on me and that the pastor, bless his heart, was watching me every week to see if my doctrine was correct, to see if I needed any um, alignment. And at the end of it, he really liked my style, my gifting, uh, my gift to communicate. And they came to me and asked me if I would teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues in this Methodist church. So I told the women what I was going to do. I gave them notice. I said, next week, next Tuesday, I'm going to teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The week after that, I'm going to pray for you, lay hands on you, uh, after I give you a part two teaching, what's the purpose of tongues? Why would I want to do it? Uh, why is there so much confusion? And so what happened is I set the, the groundwork. Everybody, not everybody came, but 99% of the women came. I did about an hour's teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They came back the next week. I taught on the benefit of being filled with the Spirit. And then I opened the altars and all of these women started coming down. And I knew in a moment's time, there was no way I could do Acts 19 verse 6 and lay my hands on all these women. They're, they were everywhere. The altars were filled both sides. And what God did that day was more than miraculous. As I started to, I walked around the altar to the uh, kneeler where they were kneeling. And I got on the other side of them. And before I could even lay hands on them, 
before I could pray or touch any of them. They were weeping and speaking in tongues. And I started to go down the line and I heard this young woman prophesying. And I just started to cry. I just was overwhelmed. And that day, not only did Acts 19, 6 happen in my presence, God manifested himself like that. But um, many of the women began to prophesy, had never prophesied in their life, had never spoken for God or from God. And it was powerful. And I don't, I don't take any credit for this. Trust me, this was God. It's a gift of God. It's not of works that anybody should boast, but over 90% of the women that day had release in the spirit. A couple of women struggled. I talked to them later on and found out they had a lot of tradition and doctrine. They were very concerned and didn't know if they really wanted this to happen in their lives. And so I encouraged them and loved them and prayed for them. But listen, prophecy is a gift for today to speak for God. So let's move on. Um, Romans 12, 6, number three. Number one is filled with scripture. Always must line up with scripture. Excuse me. Number two, it happens. It can happen momentarily when you're filled with the spirit. You can begin to prophesy. But Romans 12, 6 tells us something very unique about prophecy. Romans 12, verse 6. And it says this, Romans 12, 6. Having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether your gift is prophecy, that is prophecy, do it according to the proportion of your faith. Very interesting. Number three, you and I will prophesy in the measure of our faith, the proportion of our faith. Let me read the verse again. Whether it's prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. Now, what that means is this. If I'm going to give my first prophecy ever, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to be praying. You know, for me, my heart used to race and my hands would sweat. And I'd be saying, is this you, God? Which is ridiculous because of course it is. I can't make my heart beat fast and my hands sweat. And uh, so I'd go through this whole genre. Is that really you? Is it you, Lord? And so when I would give the prophecy, it would be like a machine gun. Brrr, just get, get this word out. But as I began to grow in God, and I began to understand the gifts and giftings of the Spirit. And I began to understand that you, you can wait on the Lord. You don't have to quench the Holy Spirit or grieve the Holy Spirit. God will make a way. I began to relax. And the prophecies got more, uh, I was going to say more lengthy. I don't think that's a correct sentence. But the prophecies got longer in nature because I was more relaxed. My faith had grown. I was used to now speaking for God, from God prophesying uh, when the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. And so if it's, sometimes if it's very lengthy, that person might be in God for many, many years or gifted of God to have prophecy. It's according to the proportion of your faith. The next thing I want to show you in 1 Timothy 1.18, that the gift of prophecy is very useful in warfare. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 if you have a prophecy you're believing or God's given you a word uh, in season, something he's going to do in the future, you need to hold on to that prophecy. You need to believe God. Um, I am in the process right now. I don't tell this a lot, but I spoke maybe two years ago at a church in New York and a gentleman who I believe to be a, a genuine real prophet came over and gave me a personal prophecy in front of other people. But uh, it had to do with me teaching on the internet. And it has not come to pass yet. But he gave a deadline, which is unusual. He said, within seven years, this is going to happen. So I wrote it down. I have it in my Bible when I went to that church, when that word was given to me. And while I'm waiting, excuse me, while I'm waiting for that word to manifest, I am using that prophecy in warfare. The enemy doesn't want my teachings on the web. Satan doesn't want people to grow in the knowledge of God and have a Bible teacher teach them the truth of God. He wants to keep us blind. You know, the Bible said the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. I think sometimes he blinds the minds of the believers. So I am in a warfare. God wants me to move forward. He wants me doing more and more teachings to more and more places. Um, and so I am holding on to this particular prophecy that was given to me that within seven years, a personal event would happen for my ministry. And uh, But I want to share with you how important it is to hold on to that and to war a warfare. 
So 1 Timothy 1.18 says this. Well, let me read 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to thee, son Timothy. Now listen to this. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might war a good warfare. You're going to have to war fair in prophecy. When God gives you a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass in 24 hours or 24 months, you have to start to use that as warfare. So when I'm praying many times, I'll remind the enemy, this is the word the Lord gave me and you're not going to stop it from coming to pass. Every promise is yes and amen to us in Christ Jesus. And that prophet told me that within seven years, proclaiming his word would be on the internet. And I'm not going to give you the details. I am teaching a couple times a week, but it's going to be more intense and it's exactly what I'm believing for. But I am warring a warfare over this because the enemy would want me to get uh, disappointed, discouraged, um, to give up, and I'm not going to do it. So what's your prophecy? What's the word that you have hidden in your heart that God has given you? Because you will have to hold on to that and fight back against the powers and principalities that want to stop you from seeing your prophecy fulfilled. And I will see this fulfilled in Jesus' name. Uh, also, since we're in 1 Timothy, if you would look at 1 Timothy 1, I think I'm in that chapter, verse, now maybe it's 2 Timothy, wait, I want, I had a verse that the Lord gave me just recently, I'm sorry, it's 2 Timothy, everybody's allowed to make a mistake, whoo, I feel better, okay, 2 Timothy 1, verse, uh, now i got to get the right chapter, hello, okay, I do apologize, um, world good warfare. Give me one second and please be patient with me. Okay. I guess I'm not going to use the verse that I thought I had. I found it. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive me, guys. I'm not polished. Maybe that's why I'm not out there yet. Anyway, it is 1 Timothy. It is chapter 4 and it is verse 14. And it said this, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee, let me slow it down, verse 14, now it we found it, 1 Timothy 4, 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by, the, by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbyters. So evidently, uh, Timothy got a gift from God through prophecy when the presbyters and the elders laid their hands on it. And I've done that. I've had God use me to give a prophecy to someone and tell them about a gifting or a calling or something they didn't know was going to happen to them. And so in 1 Timothy 4.14, he said, don't neglect the gift which was given to you by prophecy, by the laying on of hands. And so let me go over quickly just the things we covered this morning. It's filled with scripture. Luke 1, 6, 67 to 80. Number two, it can be evidence of being spirit-filled, Acts 19, 1 to 6. Number three, it is in proportion to your faith, Romans 12, 6. Number four, it is useful and necessary in warfare, 1 Timothy 1, 18. And it is a gift from God that you are not to neglect. Look at the verse again in, in 1 Timothy 4, 14. Neglect not the gift. Don't neglect the gift of prophecy. Stir it up. Pray for it. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14 for a moment and take a look at a little bit of instruction about this gift. 1 Corinthians 14. Um, I've already told you in verse 1 that we are supposed to desire the gift of prophecy. So it should be something that we desire, that we pray for that we covet. I'm trying to look up a verse in Revelation, which I'm not too graceful at this. Um, but we are to desire the gift of prophecy. And I don't know when's the last time you or I prayed, Lord, if you have a word for someone, if you have a prophecy for the church, I, I'll be your vessel, Lord. You can speak through me. And so we are to desire it. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 30 gives us some instructions. Um, 
Verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 14. If anything is revealed to another that sits by, the first can hold his peace. I want to read verse 31. 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For you may all prophesy one by one that you might learn and be comforted. There's that comfort again. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God is not a God of confusion, but peace. So understand that all of us can be used of God in the gift of prophecy, to speak under divine inspiration. I've had times right in the middle of a sermon, I'll begin to prophesy. I don't even know how many people uh, sitting under the teaching are getting it, but I have felt myself shift from Bible teacher to prophesy, to prophesying. And I knew when I was moving in a prophetic realm and saying things under just uh, an incredible mantle of an inspiration of God. So it is for all of us. Let me read verse 30 again. If anything's revealed to the first and another can hold their peace, everything is decent and in order. Verse 31, for you may all prophesy, you ready? One by one that you might learn and be um, comforted. So it can be for all of us. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, whereby brothers, brothers, yeah, brothers, I don't know who the brothers are, but wherefore brother or brethren covet to prophesy, hmm. covet to prophesy, seek it, desire it, want it. Um, I don't know, I might have told this before, but it won't hurt you to rehear it. I'll, I'll make it brief. I used to be very involved in women's ministry and we'd have board meetings once a month, sometimes twice a month. And one of the women there always had a word from the Lord. And she was on my last nerve. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5.20 for a minute. 1 Thessalonians 5.20. Um, so, because I want to talk about not despising prophecy. I started to despise this woman's gifting. Um, so let me read the verse and then I'll tell you the story. Don't despise it is my point, okay? Desire it. It's for all of us. Covet it. Pray for it because it edifies the church. And don't despise it and don't be jealous of the people that have that gift support them encourage them be thankful so first Thessalonians 5 I'm going to read 18 to 21 in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you quench not the spirit how do we quench it by despising prophecies look quench not the spirit despise not prophesying prove all things hold to that which is good do not despise prophecy. And so back to my story real quick. This girl had a word every single board meeting. It was a tongue. It was an interpretation. It was a prophecy. And I started to despise prophecy. I didn't want to hear another word she had to say. I had a terrible attitude. And uh, I just was done with this, that every single time there was a moment of silence, she had to have something to say. So I knew I was really break. I was sinning. I was quenching the spirit and I knew I had to do something about it. So I prayed and the Lord, you know, rebuked me and I had to go to her and ask her to forgive me because I was not supportive. And I said to her, why? In a very nice way, very non-threatening. I just said, how is it every single meeting you seem to have a word? And she said, I really don't know. She said, but I do fast for three days before the meeting. You do what? The woman is not eating for three days in case the Lord has something to say to us. Shame, shame, shame on me. Here I am judging her. I'm critical. I'm resentful. Uh, I'm despising prophecy. And she's gone without food three days a week. So she might have a word from God. I'll tell you, I was put in my place real quick. So don't despise prophesying. Ask for the gift of prophecy. Pray that you'd have a word anointed and inspired that would edify uplift and encourage people that's what the gifts for not so that you can get a business card i am the prophet it's so people are brought closer to jesus encouraged strengthened we need prophecy and i don't know if you have a personal prophecy or a word from god but don't forget you're in a warfare don't neglect your giftings hold on to it because god's good for it He's a man of his word. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this teaching on the gift of prophecy. I really wanted that verse in Revelation that it said the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, but I don't have the address. 
but I know the verse. And it said that the testimony of Jesus is indeed the spirit of prophecy. So Lord, let us testify of Jesus. Let us prophesy under divine inspiration, speaking for you, edifying, exhorting, and comforting people. And we thank you, we bless you, and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I will see you on my next Monday, Mana. Thank you so much for joining me.